All right. Well, good morning. And um, let's see. Let me oh, I have to do this. So this is logic design for uh, uh, Monday, the 26th of October. And um, today I'm going to review for the test uh, that's coming up Friday. And I'll also review on Wednesday. And I will post on Blackboard. There are actually already several example uh, test twos. And I'll also post the one I'm going to work right now, which is a practice test two. Uh, I'll also be available at noon today. Uh, and I'll probably make another time later in the week for a review session. If you have questions, you can just come on a Zoom session and ask your questions. Um, so I really encourage everybody, take the time, study for the test. It's going to be straightforward, and you can get a good grade on this test if you just put a little bit of study time in. Um, don't, don't blow it off. Okay, um, so that having been said, let's shrink this down. And we'll shrink it a little bit more. Something like this. And then I'm going to put this here. So first off, notice that this is uh, week 10. Here's the syllabus. And uh, today you should review units 5 through 7. And Wednesday um, you should review units 8, to, review units eight through 11. Um, but actually you can break that up however you want. Um, and we'll do, uh, we're going to review some things today. We'll review this test, and then uh, we'll review a different test on, um, on Wednesday. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a ho homework due November 6th. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry. So homework 8 is due tonight. So finish that up. Make sure you get that done. And then that's the last homework until November 6th. Um, the other thing is, I know some of you have not finished your uh, group project presentations. So try and get a video recorded today and sent to me or posted to Blackboard. I haven't, uh, I've looked at a bunch of them, but I haven't looked at all of them. Uh, if you posted one, I'll try, and, I'll try and get the rest of them looked at this afternoon and tomorrow morning. So by noon tomorrow, if you don't have, see a score posted, be sure and let me know if you have recorded a video and sent it to me and somehow I missed it, which is possible because I get so many emails and they, they get lost. And I can't necessarily take the time to watch the, the video uh, and, and put your scores in the grade book when I'm, when I'm going through my email uh, because that takes, you know, takes 15 minutes and I may only have 20 minutes to look at my email. So, um, okay. So in any event, get that done. So homework, projects, test review. Uh, be on it. And if you do that, you're going to do fine. If you did your project and you, you do the test, you, you do these two videos and you work through the practice test, I, I think you'll do great. Um, and if you don't, you're probably going to struggle. So uh, this isn't difficult material, but if you are confused, it's impossible. But if you know what you're doing, it's easy. It's that, it's that straightforward. Okay. Having said that, let's... Uh, We'll go on and start working on this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch this out. I'll make this big, and I'm going to switch out the, uh, the camera here, and we'll start working on it. Uh, hmm. I wonder why that, well, that's not too bad. It's not too good either. Let me see if I can make it better. That's a little better. And then we'll make sure we've got this focused. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's good. Okay, so the first, the first, so let me just say first off that the test is not going to be identical to, to this exam. The test is going to be similar. It's going to cover the same information, but it's just not going to be identical. So I, it, it drives me insane when students answer questions on the test with the answers that came off the practic practical the practice exams without realizing that it's not the same exam. So the answers are wrong. Uh, so don't memorize answers. Just don't even think about doing that because that's not going to work. You have to understand how to solve the problems. But if you understand how to solve the problems, you're going to be fine. And and, and that's, the, that's the whole key. So just do that. All right. Okay, so first off, this first issue is basics. 
The basic is taking a truth table and putting it into a K-map. Now, this is kind of a, this is kind of a, what I want to say, that this is, this is important skill for your understanding. But in the, in, in the real world, you probably, you, you probably have more variables than you can use a K-map on. Not always, actually. There are quite a few problems that might only have four, var four independent variables, but, or three, or even five you could still do. But, uh, but if you had, you know, seven or 10 or 20, you're obviously going to have to use other tools. But if you understand the concept, then you're, you should be okay. So, so you're not memorizing the details of a particular method. What you're doing is you're understanding the concept of how you can take a truth table and turn it into equations and how you can simplify those equations. And the K-map just happens to be a really nice visual way to simplify equations in, in five or four or three or maybe even six variables. But it, that's kind of the maximum limit. Okay, but I want you to understand this well. So the first thing is you have to remember that when you have a four variable map, you have to flip the bottom two rows and the rightmost two columns. All right. So the first is, uh, well, write out the min term notation. It might be the max term notation. So don't get stuck on min term or max term. If it's the min term notation, then what that, that word notation means, I don't want the terms. I want the, no, the, the simplified notation, which is the sum of the little m's. So all we have to do is go through here and, and see which rows have ones, and those are, those would be the min terms we need to put in our in our shorthand notation. All right, so let's number the rows, and they are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and notice they match the binary values over here. So like this is four, it's row four. This is this is a uh, nine, it's row nine. So these binary numbers match the actual number of the min term. All right. So what do we have? Well, we've got a one, three, four, six, eleven, and fourteen. So one, three, four, six, eleven, and fourteen. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six min terms. I have six ones. So that looks like it's correct. All right. Number the squares in the map. Okay. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Flip the bottom two rows. Seven. Flip the rightmost two columns, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Remember, you always want to wind up here with 15. If you don't, you made a mistake. You always want to wind up here with 7. If you don't, you, may, you slipped up. This is straightforward. But you should be able to do this. Make sure, just review this. Make sure, yep, I get it, I understand. You have to flip the bottom two rows and the rightmost two columns so that we have a single variable change between each box, both horizontally and vertically, and also wrap around. So from this one up to here, we go from one zero to zero zero. That's a one variable change. Okay, now we need to plot the ones. This is easy as pie. Because we already know it's 1, 3, 4, 6, 11, and 14. So 1, 3, 4, 6, 11, and 14. That's it. That's all there is. Okay? Now, now we have to uh, identify the prime implicants. Okay, so any, so any term is an implicant. But if we can combine that implicant with another implicant, then it's not prime. So for instance, this box by itself would be an implicant, but we can combine it with this one, so that makes it not a prime implicant. But the two combined together, can we combine this group of two with any other group of two? No, we can't. So this group of two would be prime. What about this group of two? Same thing. Combine those, that's prime. 
What about this one? Well, we can combine that with another box. We can combine it with this one. It doesn't matter that this one is already combined in another group of two. That's okay. You can reuse the terms as many times as you want. And this one combines with this one. Now, I don't see anything else that can be done. So now we have one, two, wrap around three, wrap around four. Four prime implicates. That's it. So, um, so you're done. And it turns out that every single one of these prime implicants is essential because each one of these prime implicants has a term in it not covered by any other prime implicant. This box is not covered by any other. This box is not covered by any other. This box is not covered by any other. And this box is not covered by any other. So they're all four essential. You need all four for your solution. And your solution is four three variable terms because it's a four variable map. So when you combine two boxes, you drop one variable. Now you have a three variable term. If you combine four boxes, you drop another variable, you'd have a two variable term. But there aren't any groups of four. So, and there's not any single single boxes. So you have four three variable terms that make this up and you can read them off it. Now reading them off is this, is this, is that's this, that's the, that's the scale that you need. Now the next question is put the minimum, put the minimum, check both SOP and POS form of the, of the function from the K map. Use the small K map to the right to avoid clutter if you want. Notice I only want one equation, SOP or POS, but it must be the simplest. Okay, so I don't always ask this the same, and even on the, the test you'll get, it may be a little different. But in this particular case, I want you to explore both the SOP and the POS possibilities. So I like to put in here, there aren't any don't cares, okay? And I like to put over here the zeros so I can see the ones here, which we already looked at, and the zeros over here. So let's put in the zeros. So there's a zero here, and then two zeros here. Of course, there's a one there, so we'll just leave it blank. And then we have two zeros here, and then two ones here, but there's a zero down here. There's a one here and a one there, but a zero here. And then there's a one there, but there's a blank there, and there's a zero there, and let's see. Yeah, there's a zero there. Now let's count them. We have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six ones. Since there are 16 in the map, that means we should have 10 zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, now we're going to circle the groups. The first thing you should notice, we've got all four corners. So we've got a four corner here. This is obvious, group of four. And this is obvious, group of four. And that's it. Three groups of four. Now, we already know that a group of four would be, would, would result in a two variable term. So, so it's pretty obvious. Here we have four three variable terms, and here we have one, two, three two variable terms. It's pretty obvious. Oops, you can barely see that when you fix that just a little bit. It's pretty obvious then that uh, four three variable terms is a more complicated solution because it takes four gates and each one has to have three inputs. This, we only have to have three gates plus an output gate, same up here, plus an output gate. And they only have to have two inputs. So clearly this circuit is much simpler than the circuit up here. So in this particular case, which do we want? Do we want the SOP form or the POS form? In this case, we want the POS form. It is the simplest. Now. Let's, let's look at the two solutions, just so we know. Okay, so this group of two right here, these two ones, so that would be min term. So we'll just write that. That would be A prime, B prime, D. All right? A prime, B prime, D. What about this group of two down here? That would be B, C, D prime. Okay? So that's... that's B, C, D prime. What about this wraparound group here, right here? Well, that's, that's going to be B prime, C, D. And then what about this 
wraparound group here. Well, that's going to be A prime, B, D prime. A prime, B, D prime. So the POS solution, I'm going to write it here, even though I did not ask for it. So this, you didn't, you wouldn't need to have done this, but I'm going to do it just so you know. So, so the POS, uh, sorry, the SOP is going to be A prime, B prime, D plus A prime, B, D prime plus B, C, D prime plus B prime, C, D. Okay. Now the POS is going to be these four groups. So what I do, you can do it however you want, but what I do, and it keeps me out of trouble, is I pretend these are ones, I write the min term, and then I just invert it with the Morgan's Laws. And that gives me the correct max term. And, and then that works. Now, remember, if I invert this whole expression, I don't get the min term solution. I mean, I don't get the max term solution. I get, I get, a solu I get something that's definitely in POS form, but it's the absolute inverse of the correct solution. It's not, it's not equal to the solution. So this little trick of inverting the terms just applies term by term because you don't use the same terms in the POS solution as you do in the SOP solution. In the, in the SOP solution, we're going to use terms 1, 3, 4, 6, 11, and 14. In the uh, POS solution, we're going to use all the ones we didn't mention here. We're going to use 0, 2, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13, and 15. So, so do not think that the SOP solution is ever the inverse of the POS solution, because they're not. They're equal to each other, which means they could not be inverses. All right, so we have to have three terms. The first one would be all four corners. Now, we know we've memorized that all four corners in SOP form, if these were ones, then that would give us a B prime D prime term. We invert this and what do we get? We get B plus D. So B plus D quantity, because it has to be in POS form, times, all right, what about this one? Well, that would be B D. Now we invert that. Now we're going to get B prime plus D prime. And then the final one is this one up here in the corner, which would be A, C prime. And when we invert A, C prime, we get A prime plus C. Now, obviously, this SOP solution is more complicated than this POS solution. So the correct answer would be POS, and that's the solution. B plus D, quantity times B prime plus D prime, quantity times A prime plus C. All right, let's now shift, we'll shift this up. Okay, and we'll look at this last question. Well, not the last one, the next one, the last one on this page. Now, this last question, has to do with uh, this last question has to do with um, solving uh, some um, expressions with a ROM. Now there are three different things you can use. Okay, you can use you can use uh, let me just make this a little bigger for the moment. You can use a ROM, you can use a MUX, and you can use a decoder with an additional OR gate. Those are your three options. I'm going to give you one of those three problems. So you have to be prepared for the ROM, the MUX, and the decoder with an additional OR gate. I'm not going to tell you which one you're going to get. You're going to get one of those three. So you must be ready for all three, otherwise you'll be in trouble. Don't assume it's going to be a ROM. I'm working out a ROM for this problem, and I'll work out a MUX, and I'll work out a decoder. If you know how to solve all three of those, you're in great shape. Now, they're all a little different. With the ROM, I, always, I, do, I do several functions. 
several, several Fs. With the MUX, I just do one function, and the decoder, just one function. Now remember with the decoder, you have to add this additional OR gate. So that makes it a little bit different. But with the ROM and the MUX, you don't have to add anything. Uh, the ROM is actually something we use quite frequently in our programmable hardware. In DSD, we, we use the Artrix uh, 7 chip. And this chip is has hundreds of thousands of lookup tables. We call them, we don't call them ROMs on a, on, in this case, we call them lookup tables, but they're the same thing. They're, they're just a ROM. And it's really a truth table is what it is, really, when you get right down to it. Here's our truth table right here. And here are given functions. F1, so notice we have F1, a column for F2, a column for F3, and a column for F4. And let me just make sure this thing is focused really good. It's not bad. Okay, and then we have, here are the functions. F1, the min terms 1, 2, 3, 5, 13, 15. F2 is 0, 2, 4, 6, 9, 11. F3 is 2, 5, 9, 13, 14, 15. And F4 is 6, 7, 13, 15. Okay, great. So what we have to do is put these functions in, F1, 2, 3, and 4. Well, that's easy. So we just need ones where the min terms are located. So one, remember you don't start with zero. The first, I mean, you don't start with one. The first row is zero. So the, the first one, which is one, goes here. Two, three, skip four, five, skips all the way back to 13 and 15. So here's 15, 14, 13. So it's one, two, three, five, 13, 15. 1, 2, 3, 5, 13, 15. This is 0, 2, 4, 6. So 0, 2, 4, 6, 9, 11. All right, so this is 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right. F3, 259, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 13, 14, 15. So that's just the last three, 15, 14, 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And finally, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 13, 15. So 0, 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six, seven, and then fifteen, thirteen. All right. So that's all there is to it. Now, now you could put the zeros in if you want. I don't care. You, I, I prefer this. You just put the ones in because it just gets real cluttered if you put in the zeros too. But of course, if the box is blank, it's a zero. Okay. And if you had don't cares, you'd put in the don't cares. That'd be fine too. And in, in the case of a ROM, the don't cares really don't matter. You can make them whatever you want because in this case, we're not going to simplify this function because we, we, we can fully populate this column. So there's no point in simplifying it. That's one of the interesting aspects about a ROM. When you're using ROMs to implement functions, you don't simplify anything. There's no point. But when you're making an integrated circuit and you want to minimize the surface area, now you do simplify it as much as you can and you choose don't care as carefully so that you can get down to the minimum uh, minimum number of uh, gates because you're going to make the individual gates on your integrated circuit. And the more gates you make, the more area you use, the more area you use, uh, the bigger space on your die each individual chip takes up. And the fewer chips per die you can produce, which means your cost per dot per chip goes up. So you always want to shrink the area. Um, and also there's maximum sizes. I mean, at some point the chip gets so big, it it's... Uh, it's not, it becomes uh, very difficult to manufacture without having all sorts of troubles. So we do want, so in some cases, we want to minimize uh, the equations as much as we possibly can, even looking at lots of different tricks for doing it. In other cases, we don't care. And it's really important for you as the engineer to understand why, why in some cases you don't care and why in other cases you really care a lot. Because that's part of that's part of sort of the essence of engineering is optimizing and 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 figuring out uh, 
the trade-offs between different choices to get a to get a near optimum solution. That's really what an engineer does. Any idiot can slap something together, um, although not any idiot can make an integrated circuit. But you you understand my point. Uh, you don't. It doesn't take the skill of an engineer to just slap it together. Uh, it takes the skill of an engineer to make it correct the first time and as close as near optimum as time and uh, and and techniques allow. Okay. Now this is this is our truth table. These are the four functions we want to generate with these four input variables. Now we want to now we want to implement this with this ROM. So this is the truth table here, and this is the ROM over here. Okay. So what do we have to do? Well, if we play our cards right, we can if we keep the hierarchical relationship of our independent variables a as the higher order variable, D is the lower order, B and C in between. We can just connect these to our address lines, high order to low order. So since A3 is the higher order address and A0 is the lower order, we would just go A, B, C, D, not too difficult. And our outputs, we would just assign them just like we did up here. We make O0, F1, and O1, F2, F3, and F4. Now when we've done this, the inside of our ROM can just match our truth table. So now all we have to do is just map this straight into there. Now I'm not going to copy them over, but I'll copy this column. So this would be, uh, what did I say these were? This, this was 6, 7, 13, 15, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, hell, did I have one extra? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. No, so that was, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, so that was 5. This is 6 and 7. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that would be one, two, three, four. That's our four ones for this column. I made a mistake there, so ignore that. And we do the same thing here. How did I make that mistake? I started counting with one. Big mistake, don't do that. Uh, it's easy to do, I forget to. Uh, I'm not perfect either. Okay, and then you would just call, cop, copy this in. So this would be zero, one, two, five, nine, so two, five, nine, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 15, 14, 13. All right, and so forth. You just copy this in over here, just like you did. You just copy it directly into here. Make sure you label the address lines correctly. They have to be a higher order, A, B, C, D because A3 is A, A2 is B, A1 is C, and A0 is D. And you have to make the outputs the same as they are here. But as long as you do that, then you can copy that right in there. How many bits are in this ROM? Well, that's a great question. Every box is a bit. So you've got, you've got 16 bits in each function, and you've got four outputs. So you've got 4 times 16 are 64. And yeah, and the reason you have 64, you have 2 to the n times the number of functions. You have four functions. n is 4, so 2 to the n is 16, so it's 16 times 4 functions, or 64. OK? Now, typically on our on our FPGAs, uh, the, our our Artrix Seven that we use in DSD has lot sixes, so it has six independent variables. But each truth ta each lookup table, our truth table, our ROM, only has uh, uh, one variable. So we have s six input variables, and that gives us sixty four rows. 
but we only have one function. So, so we have 64 bits in every lookup table, but only one function. Okay, <clears throat> so that completes that page. All right, if you have questions, come to Zoom and ask them. Make sure you understand what we're doing. All right, let's look at this. Now we're gonna talk about flip-flops, all right? So, so here we go. So for a JK flip-flop, draw how you would turn this into a D. All right, so this, you should know this, cold. You put an inverter into K, and then otherwise you connect these, and this is a D input. What if you wanted to make a T? If you wanted to make a T, you just cross out the inverter. The inverter has to go into K, otherwise it's going to work backwards. What kind of a clock? Well, it's got a carrot on it, so it's an edge clock. It's got a bubble, so it's a falling edge. So it's a falling Or you could call it a neg edge. In in Verilog, we say N E G E D G E neg edge. Does this flip flop have a set input shown? No. It's got an asynchronous clear. It's got a input up here. So no, it doesn't have a set. It has an asynchronous clear. Is the asynchronous clear active high or active low? Well, there's no bubble, so it's active high. If it had a bubble, it would be active low which means it's only asserted, or it's only having an effect when it's high. Give the switching function for G. Given the switching function for G here, draw with Gates how to realize it in two layers, and then show how you would modify the expression to implement it with Gates having only two inputs maximum. All right, so this switching function, so what is it? So it's, it has one R gate, two R gates, so it's got two R gates and then one output AND gate. So we have one big R gate here and another big R gate here. And then these two go into an AND gate. And there's your output F or G. And so what do you put have in here? You have A, B, C, D. And here you have A prime, B prime, C, D. All right. Now, how would you do it if you had gates having only two inputs max? Well, so now you have to have, now you have to have an or, or gates going in here. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to run out of gates. And these go into an OR gate here. And then you have another set of OR gates over here. Sorry. And these go into another OR gate here. And then these just go into an AND gate. So this would be A, B, C, D. And this would be a prime, B prime, C, D, but you actually don't even need this gate. You could just take this one and bring it over here if you really wanted to, either way. And here's your output, G. All right. Now, one uh, little caveat on this. Um, that's true for ORs and ANDs. But if you have NORs or NANs, then this doesn't work. You have to put inverters in here to make that work then. And so that's a little trick. And those inverters, remember, if you have a NAND gate, you can make it into an inverter just by tying the inputs together. That's also equal to an inverter. Those are equivalent. Okay, and same for an OR gate. In dealing with hazards, check true or false for the following statements. In deciding whether a hazard is a problem, you must consider the downstream logic. Yeah, that's right. 
all hazards aren't problems. Again, I, I think the example I used or talked about, if your downstream logic, say, is a, a digital gate that's uh, got a very <clears throat> uh, fast, what we call narrow clock, a little glitch might actually trigger it. So if you're dealing with, say, uh, the control logic in a missile silo that's going to launch a rocket, uh, say, onto Russia uh, with nuclear weapons on it, then you don't want any hazards because that, that might screw things up. A little glitch might actually launch the rocket. So obviously you would be super careful in designing that hardware so that, so that, uh, so that there was really, so that you didn't have any hazards and you would do pretty extensive testing to make sure that was the case because the last thing you want is an accident. Uh, but on the other hand, let's say you're designing a system to ring a mechanical school bell for a school uh, to mark the end of each class and, uh, and when the next class starts. Well, uh, a little you know, 10 nanosecond spike is so short that for a mechanical bell, the mechanical bell wouldn't even twitch wouldn't do anything because it's just not enough energy to cause any motion in the bell. It's too, too narrow a pulse. 10 nanoseconds is really short. The bell probably would take a pulse approaching a second to get uh, anything. And a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So you'd need something about a billion times wider, or say a 10 nanosecond, so about 100, 100 trillion times wider. Uh, sorry, yeah, 100 million times wider to, uh, to, to even get close to what you needed to, to have a downstream effect. So that's why the downstream logic makes, makes the difference on whether you have to worry about hazards or not. So yes, it absolutely does. The standard approach I taught to fix a hazard is to add an, an essential prime implicant. No, any essential prime implicant already has to be part of your solution anyway. What you were supposed to add was one of the non-essentials, which turns out to be, in many cases, it, it, well, it, it, it is a consensus term. Not all non-essentials are consensus terms, but in this case, uh, you add a consensus term. If all gates had a zero propagation delay, there would not be hazards. No, uh, well, yeah, I guess that's true. I don't know, I, never, I don't even remember ever asking that question. I'd have to think about it now that I think about it. Um, yeah, if there were no delays, there should be no hazards. The hazards are, ba are based on the fact you have an extra gate in the pathway. So, yeah, so if, if, the, uh, if all the gates had zero propagation delay, there would be no hazards. A consensus term can fix a hazard because the variable that changes to cause the hazard is not in the consensus term, and that's right. The consensus term fixes a hazard because the, the problem is with a variable that's changing from, a, from say, a, a prime, a, an inverse to a non-inverted value, and you get this delay in the inverter, and uh, the, ha the, the, the consensus term typically doesn't contain that variable, and so that's why it fixes it. Um, okay, given the VHDL code, draw a circuit. Okay, so here's the code. A and B after A and B and C after 10 nanoseconds. So that's going to look something like this. An AND gate A, B, C with a 10 nanosecond delay. <coughs> Excuse me. X, R, Y, and the output here is E, by the way. X, R, Y after 10. So we have an OR gate with X and Y. And it's got 10 nanoseconds, too. And then E, and e H, and Z, or E, F, and Z, and, this, and the output of this is F, by the way. H is E and with F and with Z after 5. So here's your big AND gate here. We get E, we get F, and we get Z, and we have 5 nanoseconds here, and the output of that is H. Okay, so now we've drawn it. Now, if A equals 0, what is the output H? So if A is a 0, this that puts out a 0, and that's a 0, therefore H has to be 0. doesn't matter what F is or Z. They can both be 1s, doesn't matter. You have 0, 1, 1, H is still a 0. If Z equals 0, what is the output H? 
same thing. If z is 0, then you have 0 in here. It doesn't matter what e and f are. h is 0. For f, use kmap, find all min terms, and write the shorthand notation. Okay, so this is uh, an interesting use of a kmap. Uh, let's see, we have to shift this paper up. So for, for f, use a kmap, find all min terms, and write the shorthand notation. Remember, this is the shorthand notation. f equals the sum of the min terms, so we just have to write in the min terms. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we're going to plot these terms on this map, and then we'll see what all the min terms are. Now, on a four-variable map, a two-variable term would have how many boxes associated with it? It would have four boxes, so that would be four min terms. And then, so this is going to be four boxes. A three-variable term is going to be two boxes. Three-variable term is going to be two boxes. But they might overlap, so we have to pay attention. So first off, AC. So remember the alternative labels. So this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. So if we have A, C, we have A, C, so that's one, two, three, four. B, D, C. So B is the center two. D is this, these four boxes here. And C prime would be the two top. So it would be here. And then finally we have A prime, B prime, C. A prime, B prime is this column. C prime then would be up here. So that's it. So we have 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we don't have 12, but we have 13, 14, 15. So that's the shorthand notation. So we did have a little bit of overlap because we only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh, actually, I guess we didn't have any overlap. So we've got exactly 8. Yeah, we do. Yeah, exactly. OK. Starting with the SOP form for F, put it in a form that would represent a two-layer net with NAND-NAND layers, okay? So you guys all did this in your projects. Another reason why I like you to do the project. So we do an invert and a second invert. And we partially expand the inner one. And we get BC inverted plus, uh, times a prime C prime D inverted times B D prime inverted and then the whole thing inverted. So the whole thing's a NAND gate, NAND gate, NAND gate, NAND gate. That's NAND, NAND form. Remember, if we look at these gates, so AND or NAND and NOR. They look like this. So AB, that's an AND gate. A plus B, that's an OR gate. AB with an invert on it is a NAND gate. And A plus B with an invert is a NOR gate. <coughs> Remember these. These will really help you. OK, final problem. Is this one down here. Now this one causes some anxiety among students. No reason for it. It's very straightforward. All right. Using the JK flip-flop pictured, write in the tracing for Q in the timing diagram. Assume the time for the output to change after the active edge of the clock is 10 nanoseconds. Assume setup and hold times can be ignored and that Q equals 1 at T equals 0. Okay, so Q starts at 1 at t equals 0. So we'll mark q at 1 here. Now, the first thing you should do when you evaluate something like this is to, uh, is to go in and, and pay attention. So first off, you, what kind of clock do we have? Is it a rising edge or a falling edge? 
it is a rising edge. So since it's a rising edge, we know that this is the active edge right here. So, so this is where our inputs matter. So at this rising edge, what is J? J is 0 and K is 1. At this rising edge, J is 1 and K is 1. At this rising edge, J is 1 and K is 1. At this rising edge, J is 1, K is 0. At this rising edge, J is 0, K is 1. At this rising edge, J is 1, K is 0. Now, in order to make sense of this, you have to remember that J sets, K clears. If they're both 1, then it toggles. And if they're both, uh, well, if, if they're both equal to 0, then it clears. That's not quite right. But anyway, if they're both 0, it clears. I mean, sorry. Hush my, wash my mouth out with soap. It's hold. Not clears. Hold. So set, clear, toggle, hold. J sets, K clears. If they're both 1, it toggles. If they're both 0, it holds. All right, so what's here? So this is J is 0, so this is going to clear. They're both 1, it's going to toggle, toggle, set, clear, set. Okay, so we start, it, we start now with Q at 1. Now, we get this, and that's going to clear. So, but is it going to clear right here? No, it's going to clear 10 nanoseconds later. So now it's going to go down. So we can put a little tick 10 nanoseconds after our, our, our edge so we know the action is going to be right there. The action is going to be right there. It's not going to be at the clock edge. The clock edge tells us when it reads the inputs. But the actual transition for the output is, is delayed. Now it's going to, can't change until this air here. And now what it's going to do, toggle. Since it's 0, a toggle makes it go to 1. Now here, it's going to toggle back. It's going to stay down. Here it's going to clear so it won't go anywhere. Here it's going to, oh, sorry, this was a set, my bad. Uh, it's going to set, so it's going to go up. It's going to stay up. Here it's going to clear. It's going to go back down. Here it's going to stay down until here, and it's going to set again and stay up. So that's what it looks like. And that's just really straightforward. Now, I will work another one of these problems where we have an, an asynchronous input, either a set or a clear, and I'll show you how to deal with that. But remember, the first thing you want to do is mark your active clock edge. Then remember, the actual transitions are 10 nanoseconds delayed. But mark how it reads the inputs at that clock edge. If you just have a D, you only have to worry about the one input. But if you have JK, then you have to worry about J and K. J is 0, K is 1, so that's a clear. Both 1, it's a toggle. Both 1, it's a toggle. J is 1, K is 0, so that's a set. J is 0, K is 1, so that's a clear. J is 1, K is 0, so that's a set. And remember, all you have to remember for J, K flip-flop is J sets, K clears. If they're both 1, it toggles. If they're both 0, it clears. That's all you have to remember. All right, so that pretty well does it. Uh, so we'll finish the recording. Uh, here and uh, feel free to come on at noon and I will do a little quiz for this lecture uh, just to uh, encourage you to watch these so you're ready for the test. Okay, and that'll do it.